All right, rock and roll. Hey, hey, everyone. So we're gonna, well, I'm gonna move into Jean Baudrillard's America now. So uh, I guess there are some a few things to say about this before getting into it. This was released in 1986. Before I lie to you, I want to make sure. Yes, first published in 1986. Um, the version I'm dealing with now is the Verso version with the blue sky mostly on the cover uh, it's an introduction by Jeff Dyer and this is interesting, I just learned this recently that, courtesy of Richard Smith that the photos in this book are not, or weren't actually taken by Baudrillard they were taken by someone else, uh, another photographer and this is, this is uh, important because uh, Baudrillard wasn't just known uh, for being a theorist, or being a philosopher, but was uh, also a photographer, and he, he was he was quite a good photographer too. If I'm I'm no expert on that, but he is some of his photographs are really quite uh, breathtaking. So this book, when we're dealing with it, and it can be quite um, confusing in that way, the photographs don't actually really speak to the text because they weren't taken by Baudrillard. But that, that does not mean that we can't still, I guess, infer some kind of Baudrillardian meaning out of the photographs. It would just be interesting if they were his. And I learned as well that there are versions of this book that do include his photographs. They're just a little bit more difficult to find. So Baudrillard wrote this book, uh, I guess, over the course of his trip to America. And this was around the time in the 80s when he was traveling a lot. So, in 1981, he had visited Japan and got a, uh, his first camera, I believe, and that's when he got into photography, and then he started going all over, and over, over his lifetime, he was, um, he liked to travel to many different places, I believe he spent a lot of time in Brazil or other places in South America, uh, America, obviously, he was, uh, he spent time in, um, and, uh, a lot of time in Australia, I think, in Japan. So he was really all over, and this book is really, uh, I, I think, seminal Baudrillard. Like many people will point anyone else to this direct in, in, into this book's direction or toward this book because it captures a lot of what Baudrillard has to say. And one more thing before really getting into it, um, from this point on in Baudrillard's work, it'll become increasingly difficult for me to really talk about it because it's it's really aphoristic. Now what I mean by that is that um, it, it's all over the place. From paragraph to paragraph, it's just a totally different idea. Kind of a Baudrillard's journal, which makes it kind of complicated to trace a coherent or cohesive um, analysis that would be linear. So for that, for that reason, like I'm going to pick out some things he says, rather than kind of running through it chronologically, and use them to explore what I think are some of Baudrillard's key, key, yeah, key themes, some of his key ideas, and how they are expressed in his analysis of America, the country. So when talking the motiv about the motivation for his traveling to America, he writes that he went in search of astral America. Please excuse all the noise that is banging around out there. So he said he went, he said he, he went in search of astral America, not social and cultural America, but the America of the empty, absolute freedom from the freeways, not the deep America of moors and mentalities, but the America of desert speed, of motels and mineral surfaces. I looked for it in the speed of the screenplay, in the indifferent reflex of television, in the film of days and nights projected across an empty space, in the marvelously effective affectless succession of signs, images, faces, and ritual acts on the road, looked for what was nearest to the nuclear and innucleated universe, a universe which is virtually our own, right down to its European cottages. So this is really interesting because he makes a clear split between what we would think to be, or what he really lays out as being, the cultural America. So what you'd find in schools, what you'd find in urban settings, anything like that, 
if we can say that America has an identity. And for him, he was really interested in, I guess, the absence of America. Because for him, ultimately, America has no face. So he went to the places, or thought the places that had no face to them, i.e. the desert, the kind of desolate landscape, as being wholly indicative of what America is. Because, as Baudrillard writes, the desert is simply an ecstatic critique of culture, an ecstatic form of disappearance. Now, I find these ideas really fascinating and really difficult to reconcile, partly because I have a certain bias, I have a certain, I guess, uh, predisposition toward, to thinking that Baudrillard is a thinker of the masses. Baudrillard is the thinker of urban spaces. Baudrillard is the thinker of the media. You know, insert keyword here. But his fascination with the emptiness of these spaces is particularly interesting to me. And I think that, you know, I can reconcile that because it speaks to the general emptiness of these other things that, that he considers. So, and, and this, I think, opens up a really interesting part of, of Baudrillard's work it, where nothing really appears as it is on the surface. And he really explores this later on in his other works dealing with photography, but we'll get into that, um, I guess, in the next, next ones. But where there appears to be the most movement, where there appears to be the most kind of, um, I guess, urban anxiety or anything like that, for Baudrillard, there really is silence. There really is a sort of absence of any kind of, you know, uh, I will reluctantly say, reality. And moreover, how our emphasis on the, the quick, the fast-paced movement of our daily lives does put us in a sort of non-space. So, you know, one good way to think about this is to take, like, Star Wars, where the move towards hyperspeed is, is, is followed by having all the stars kind of stretch out and elongate as the, you know, the Millennium Falcon is moving through them, but they are kind of arrested in, in space at that point. For just a moment, of course, and then the Falcon gets where it's going, but everything freezes for a moment, and it's really interesting. And Baudrillard really wants to think about this, and it's and it, he is indebted to Virilio for this as the thinker of speed, but how does speed sort of bring space together in I guess a form of arrested development where it freezes space, where we are moving faster and faster and faster, and how that brings everything closer together, effectively crystallizing it. So for him, the, the, the result is that there is no seduction here, for seduction requires a secret. Speed is simply the right that initiates us into emptiness, a nostalgic desire for forms to revert to immobility concealed beneath the very intensification of their mobility. So seduction, for those that aren't um, familiar, oh, okay. here's the elevator pitch. Seduction is um, the allowance of a sort of antagonism to play out between two sides of a binary. So hot and cold, for instance, is one that he thinks about where hot seduces cold and cold seduces hot, effectively resting each from their subject position towards a certain degree of indeterminacy where they can develop and change, not, not necessarily in the Deleuzean deterritorialization sense, but really to put these two elements into play, where they never really break away from their ontological condition as being separate from the other, but rather how their conditions are always brought into question and how they always change and develop across time and space. So this goes away in the emptiness of the desert, where there is a sort of homogenization taking place, there is a sort of eradication of difference, of culture, of identity, in the, you know, hyper-real realization of space itself, or of movement through space. So in, I guess, as we are faced with all of this, the sort of speed-focused um, condition of our lives, Baudrillard says, or asks, how far can we necessarily engage with this sort of uh, system before we ourselves disappear. Now, I'd, if I had someone else here, we could, you know, we could talk for days about whether or not uh, the human has already disappeared or what the human is in relation to Baudrillard. 
but what he considers here is, and, and this is, you know, it, it does point to something of an odd pragmatism in his work, he states that our only solution is to, quote, um, aim for the point of no return. So go faster than the system itself. Which would probably result in the system crumbling, the system being made a joke of itself or a parody of itself, but that is really one of the only solutions he leaves us with. And I had um, uh, the founder of the Journal of Baudrillard Studies was one of my professors, and he used to say that for Baudrillard there are really two solutions. Either we're going to end in total, I guess, apocalyptic nuclear destruction, or we are going to be left in a kind of homeopathic, um, I guess, stasis. It's kind of left in like a, we can think of Wally, -E, you know, that Pixar film where the, all the humans are in that uh, kind of cruise in almost total bliss. They forget how to use, like, they're, they're, they are detached from their bodies, and they are just floating, essentially. So it's kind of one or the other, which, which we, you know, we can, we, can, we can think of other possibilities, but it does, I think, in a sense, point to what at least Baudrillard would be very much prepared to accept in relation to this text. So now we jump from California, from the desert, to New York. So really, my, really the polar opposite. So of New York, Baudrillard writes that the beauty other cities only acquired over centuries has been achieved by New York in 50 years. So some of the observations he lays out of New York is, is, is the um, kind of, it's his recognition of New York being a meeting place of a plethora of different cultures and ethnicities in one rather small, relatively, uh, location. And of course, Baudrillard makes some rather problematic claims about what constitutes race or anything like this, but he does, I think, have a point about, about something where he says that whiteness seems an extenuation of physical adornment, a neutrality which, perhaps by that very token, claims all the exoteric powers of the word, but ultimately will never possess the esoteric and ritual potency of artifice. Now what he necessarily means by that is difficult to say, but it is interesting because he does lay, a, lay out a general animosity towards this thing called whiteness. Because whiteness it does represent that sort of deterritorialized uh, figure that floats around, that, can, that, that consumes other cultures, that consumes other identities. And it does this, you know, in order to kind of homogenize the world or it's part of this kind of neo-colonial, neo-imperial neo project. But where he, when he says that associated, or what, is, what stands opposed to that is artifice, he loses me to some, to some extent, because that would seem to be the most artificial to me, at least in the way that I described it, as being that free-floating, deterritorialized being, seems incredibly artificial. So in order for us to kind of reconcile that or square that, we would have to assume that the free-floating character of whiteness, that thing that you know, it's, it's rather ex exoteric, does in itself constitute an ontological certainty associated with some kind of biological determinism, right? Where white, that is what whiteness is. Hence, it's being opposed to artifice. It is kind of the natural condition of whiteness. Which, like, I would agree with. To some extent, you know, that we can certainly problematize that in a number of ways. And we have to take Baudrillard to task on this because he can, you know, he feels like he can write whatever he wants, but he says some pretty violent things. So in that way, we, you know, I'll keep, keep that on the back burner for now until other stuff comes up. So to get back onto this, he says that people often say that in Europe the streets are alive, but in America they are dead. To which he replies that no, that is in fact not the case. For him, the streets are very much alive in America, and it is for that reason, in their kind of hyper-realization, in their hyper-movement, that they do represent something of a, of a change, something of a, I guess, a digression from, you know, the European model, 
and he's really speaking like French thinker here, like, his ideas about America were not, um, I guess were not strange at that time from uh, a French European, like, <laughs> French intellectuals uh, had a lot of animosity for this thing called America, whereas I guess Baudrillard does have some fascination with it. Uh, and, yeah, sorry, I've been digressing a lot and a lot. So for him, there were millions of people in the streets, wandering carefree, violent, as if they had nothing better to do, and doubtless they have nothing else to do than produce the permanent scenario of the city, where it is that idea of the city that is being realized, at least this is how I understand it, the idea of the city is being realized in its constant proliferation, right? So we think of the city, what do we think? Think of like movement, think of sound, think of um, like just loudness. And what better way to make that true, or make that real, than to realize it in its hyper-real form. Hence the version of New York City that he's laying out. So I think we would do well to understand the motivation behind, or the these acts coordinated by the city, you know, to maintain the idea of the city, do correspond to something of a strategy. Now this comes down to the individual as well, where Baudrillard, and this, I think this is one of the key themes across all of this work, where we constantly try to remind ourselves or we create certain discourses, like the unconscious, like class, like things like that, that operate to convince us of a sort of, of, a sort of um, condition that which determines us. And for that reason, it gives us a general locus of power or a sort of point of authority that we can either challenge or try to understand. So to this, Baudrillard writes that, do we continually have to prove to ourselves that we exist? A strange sign of weakness, harbinger of a new fanaticism for a faceless performance, endlessly self-evident. So kind of tautological in that way. But I think it's, it speaks to that, and thinking about the city in this way, you know, I, I am extrapolating from that idea and kind of uh, transposing it onto the individual, but it does make an interesting case for how Baudrillard conceives of certain things pertaining to the human, especially in America, where, you know, in the land of pornography, for instance, like, of course that is not what, what sex is, but we use it to convince ourselves of being sexual or having this kind of natural uh, component or characteristic to kind of con excuse me, to kind of convince us of our naturality. And ultimately what he says is that uh, all this acceleration, all this sort of movement, is not an acceleration of anything particularly interesting for him, but it's an acceleration of the banal. It is an acceleration of in the inconsequential. Now in thinking about America as a whole, keeping this in mind, Baudrillard writes that America is neither a dream nor reality. It is a hyper-reality. It is a hyper-reality because it is a utopia which has behaved from the very beginning as though it were already achieved. Everything here is real and pragmatic, and yet it is all the stuff of dreams, too. It may be that the, it may be that the truth of America can only be seen by a European, since he alone will discover here the perfect simulacrum, that of the imminence and material transcription of all values. The Americans, for their part, have no sense of simulation. They are themselves simulation, in its most developed state, but they have no language in which to describe it, since they themselves are the model. So, I guess thinking about this in, in, another, in other terms would be like trying to explain to a fish what is what water is. It would be a very difficult uh, task, and this isn't like a difficult idea to grasp. You know, even if we apply some kind of uh, vulgar analysis of technology, thinking of Silicon Valley or anything like that, our relationship to this mythical thing called reality has certainly come into question. And America, at least in the way that Baudrillard is describing it, is, I guess, the epitome of that. So ultimately, as he writes, America is a giant hologram. And I just, uh, I just noticed on the back of this book, one of the reviews by Rolling Stone says that this book is filled with per perceptive, almost poetic observations 
Like, of course it's poetic. What do you mean almost poetic? I don't, I don't understand. What is it if it's not poetic? Perceptive? I don't know, that's weird. So I want to take a, take a moment to bring this back to one of his earlier books. And it's kind of speaking to his, his first three books. Um, but specifically I want to think about for a critique of the political economy of the sign, in which he lays out the, the kind of framework of the homo cyberneticus, or the cybernetic human, whatever that means. And he states in that that the human will be sort of granted, the human will be um, gifted with an unconscious. Not because the unconscious is real, per se, but because the unconscious gives us the semblance of a sort of reality. Because of its position in you know, relation to us as, as biological beings, and our relationship to history or what have you. And in that, this is very much realized in, in how he depicts humans in America. And a funny way that he puts it is by saying that Americans have no identity, but they do have wonderful teeth. And I think that that's really quite poetic, because it speaks to a sort of obsession with the way in which America presents itself. Not necessarily with what exists inside and I'm gonna sound like a like a YouTube motivational speaker but it is much more interested in the in the vanity of being in some way or other which we is almost ironic because it would seem as though it would be the opposite it would we would have uh, a stronger vested interest in maintaining a sort of identity right a, a, a fake one nevertheless but one that has, uh, that is grounded inside the body, form of the, the unconscious, the psyche, or what have you. So it's just it's interesting like this. So it seems as though we, we see a transition where at one time there was that interest in maintaining a sort of um, certainty, biological certainty. Now it seems as though it comes out in our identity or how we present ourselves. So for, and Baudrillard thinks about this in relation to how everyone is smiling, and he finds that very unsettling, and it reminds me of the Cheshire Cat, how the smile lasts longer than the person, where the cat disappears, but the smile lingers, and it is that idea that sort of whitewashed, um, never, never negatives, always supposed to be happy version of America, kind of like the, uh, the Truman Show, which is a, a movie that he uh, talks about quite a bit. So he says that the care taken of the body, while it is alive, prefigures the way it will be made up in the funeral home, where it will be given a smile that is really into death. And it's, he calls this the om omnipresent cult of the body, which is, you know, uh, an interesting way to put it, because it is that sort of narcissistic self-reflection that we maintain, and, and an idea that we must maintain in order to convince ourselves of our position within this simulated world. So in that way it could be a strategy, kind of a survival strategy employed by just people in order to exist in this world. But anyway, this idea of smiling even into death is one that is, is very unsettling for Baudrillard because if we jump back to symbolic exchange and death, death is that thing that Baudrillard states we have lost connection to. So we lost connection to it by conjuring away the kind of negativity of it, if I can, you know, be blunt like that. And instead, you know, death is what occurs in certain zones. Death is not something that can, you know, touch any of us in any sort of capacity other than, you know, in these specific zones. So it's for that reason we see it, uh, whitewashing is a, is a decent term here, but the conjuring away of negativity in some sense. So another aspect of this kind of self-maintenance um, that Baudrillard is interested in is, is exercising or bodybuilding or jogging, where he writes that there is a direct line that runs from the medieval instruments of torture via the industrial movements of production line work to the techniques of schooling the body by using mechanical apparatuses, where there is that 
striving towards perfection. It's an idea of perfection, right? That this idea of perfection doesn't exist in nature. Whoa. If someone asks you, where is perfection, what would you point to? Point to God? Where does that, where is that? So we, we fabricated an idea of perfection and the, the entire culture industry around that, achieving that uh, idea of perfection is really made apparent in zones like the gym or in the general logic of, of health that is, is extremely exclusionary, right? And, and it, it, I guess, generates an image or an ideal image of what the body should look like, of how people, what people should look like, that you know, obviously it excludes people and in doing so is effectively a strategy at um, conjuring away the, po the possibility of, of bodily difference, whatever that might, might, might be. But it is all in, in the effort of creating a homogenous image of what anything is, what the, what the body should be like, what the city should be like, what the country should be like, what the world should be like, in favor of these artificial ideals. Not to say that <laughs> any ideals aren't artificial, but in the maintenance of the, the American ideals. Now, what does science, how does science contri contribute to this whole, uh, this whole cluster crap of, of a mess? Well, for Baudrillard, we have a scientific fascination with the idea of prolonging life. And for him, the only reason we do that is to give us the semblance of a meaningful life, where we kind of oddly, for some I guess almost random reason, believe that a meaningful life has any sort of correlative with length, right? So it is for that reason that we have, um, that we can take, for instance, as he writes, if you think about the forms that desire currently takes, anti-nuclear shelters, cryogenization, high-pressure therapy, you see that they are exactly the forms of extermination. To avoid dying, one chooses to withdraw into some, into some protective bubble or other. In this light, we should take it as a reassuring sign that people lost interest in anti-nuclear protection so quickly, the shelter market has become a mere prestige market, like the market for artworks or luxury yachts. Because we must go on, right? There, and we, we use this as a strategy, and this is very much in the same vein as, as Hannah Arendt when she, when she writes about the dissipation of the public and the private in, the, in favor of the social, what we are seeing is a sort of disappearance of, of meaning, if you will, in favor of, where it's simply a quantity over quality, I will say, to be, to be blunt. So we have, a, we have a fascination with exposure, right? We have a fascination with making everything apparent. So for Baudrillard, society had become emancipated here as nowhere else on earth. The psychiatric hospitals have been opened up, public transport is free, and yet paradoxically this ideal has become closed, in on itself as if behind a wall of glass, where it is a sort of, we can think of this as a sort of oppression through emancipation, right? Or a repressive desublimation, as the, um, as the uh, Marcusians might say. And what that means is sublimation is, I guess, this, the, um, not repression, the, the self-suppression, which is just suppression of desires that come out in other forms, like fetish or something like that. So desublimation would be the realization of these desires, but in a repressive form, where, you know, although they appear to be free, are actually mandated under the control of a sort of, of any sort of uh, oppressive apparatus. And in the case of the Marcusian stream, that would be capitalism, where it's kind of the paradox of choice. Capitalism, no matter what comes out of it, is going to belong to some, some kind of an oppressive scheme, schematic. So then I want to present one of the funny moments in here where uh, Baudrillard is thinking about or writing about Halloween, where he says that there, there is nothing funny about Halloween. This sarcastic festival reflects rather an infernal demand for revenge by children on the adult world. 
The threat from this evil force hangs over adults here, equal in intensity only to their devotion to children. There is nothing more unhealthy than this childish sorcery. Behind all the dressing up in the presence, people turn out their lights and hide for fear of harassment. And maybe we can think of this like uh, Halloween as a sort of like pressure valve, right? As a sort of release of um, violence, a release of a sort of anxiety held by people in the form of this kind of ritual where people are allowed to be other than themselves, right? Or to, are allowed to express some degree of otherness. But it would ultimately be an otherness that is subsumed by the system again and pushes the system forward. So if we were to accept this idea of Halloween and how I kind of proposed it, um, it speaks to our, as Baudrillard writes, our single passion, the passion for imminent, for the passion for images, sorry, and the imminence of desire in the image, because that is really all we are. We are never other than the image. So any attempt we make to break out of that would simply fail, incredibly. But it is that hyper-real version of the images in the form of, you know, the television, the, the media, anything like that, that push it to, you know, the hyper-real oppressive form. Where this is not to say, and I believe that this point often gets lost when thinking about Baudrillard, Baudrillard is not a thinker against simulation per se, because simulation has always ever been. It is a condition of our lives in that we only present ourselves in the form of images, but rather we, we have to make a distinction between the hyper, the hyper real version and the you know, standard simulation, or the oppressive and non-oppressive forms of simulation. So from here we can think about his thoughts on, on fame. So what does it mean to be famous? So what he writes is that one of America's specific problems is fame and glory partly on account of its extreme rarity these days, but also because of, ex of its extreme vulgarization. Then he quotes Andy Warhol, who states that in the future, everyone will be famous for 15 minutes. To which Baudrillard writes, and it is true, which is certainly the case, you know, with Twitter, Instagram, or whatever. Anyone with the right quip, with the right photo, with the right video can get their 15 minutes, no problem. They can show up on Ellen, they could show up on The View or, or whatever, or, you know, Fox News, and then the, they, they will have made it, right, for the, even for that 15 minutes. And it's the sort of democratization of fame, of excellence, that, you know, would have Hannah Arendt, you know, rolling around in her, in her grave, where these things have, through their democratization, have allowed for a sort of, I guess, nullification of their possibility, where they are simply banal at this point. Now to return to this idea of um, America opposed to Europe, Baudrillard writes that ours, being Europe, is a crisis of historical ideals facing up to the impossibility of their realization. Theirs, America, is the crisis of an achieved utopia, confronted with the problem of, of its duration and permanence. The Americans are not wrong in their idyllic convic conviction that they are at the center of the world, the supreme power, the absolute model for everyone. And this conviction is not so much founded on natural resources, technologies, and arms, as on the miraculous premises, premise of a utopia made reality, of a society which, with the directness we might judge unbearable, is built on the idea that it is the realization of everything the other has dreamed of. Justice, plenty, rule of law, wealth, freedom. It knows this, it believes in it, and in the end, the others have become to believe in it too. So another way we can think about this is to uh, look at Balt, so Roland Balt. Um, at the beginning of his mythologies, uh, he writes about wrestling. So for him, wrestling does this as well. Where we see the realization of justice in wrestling to the extent that we can't, we've never been able to see it anywhere else. And this fascinated him, just as. America fascinates Baudrillard because it is that hyper-real realization of these institutions that, you know, surely don't actually abide by any sort of real justice. Like, look at uh, discrimination or, or, or inequality. Like, surely justice is a farce. But there is the image of it, and there is 
an attachment to it that by many remains unquestioned. And America is able to do this because for Baudrillard it has no past and no founding truth. So if we think of New York again, where New York was able to achieve the beauty of the other cities that have been around for centuries in just 50 years, America is able to attain these ideals in the form of justice or truth or reason so unbelievably quickly that it boggles the mind and it does represent something of a, I guess, a utopic vision for Baudrillard as he writes it here. And that is, I think it's very, very true, you know, the, the way that the discourse around truth proliferates today or the search for truth in the wake of fake news or whatever that might that might mean, which ultimately just attests to the fragility of this idea called truth. And this search, you know, there's the belief that if we strike those people claiming fake news in the face with, with facts, then the problem will go away. When in fact it is that sort of, it is that belief in sort of fundamental truth that can be attained that creates these oppositions and it's dialectical in this way and it's stupidly Hegelian, but it does create these moments. But funnily enough, funnily, uh, Baudrillard writes that America is then a paradox because obviously utopia can never be realized, so for that reason it must be a paradoxical thing. And I believe the only way we're able to really think about this is uh, through the, I guess, transcendental properties of hyperreality or simulation how it is able to put things above others to create a kind of new plane on a new dimension where things, contradiction can be eradicated, contradictory, contradiction can be effaced, and things can maintain themselves in their sort of all endless possibility in the form of it, their own image. And again, in opposition to Europe, Baudrillard writes that we transform, that is Europe, the real into ideas or into ideology here in America, only what is produced or manifested has meaning. For us, in Europe, only what can be thought or concealed has meaning. Even materialism is only an idea in Europe. It is, it is in America that it becomes concretely, it is in America that it becomes concretely realized in the technical operation of things, in the transformation of a way of thinking into a way of life, in the action of life. For the materiality of things is, of course, their cinematography, or, how I understand it, as I have been saying, in their realization in the form of an image. And this, America, is exactly what utopia should look like. And he asks, is this the result of a successful revolution, to which he, res he, he responds to himself, saying, absolutely. This is exactly, like Disneyland, as he writes, is utopian. Santa Barbara is a paradise. The U.S. is a paradise. Paradise is a paradise. Mournful, monotonous, and superficial though it may be, it is paradise. Of course, this is limited to, cer to certain people. Like, I don't think the people living in uh, Flint, Michigan are, are living in paradise. But it is the idea of America that permeates, and it is that idea that Baudrillard is most interested in. So what is America? America is New York. America is... California. America is Las Vegas. And it is for that reason, he says, okay, fine. What does that look like? Or what is that? To which he replies, it is highly utopian, and in that way, highly oppressive in some form. But there is, you know, Baudrillard, in, in not being interested in those other forms that America can take, the other more not really oppressive forms, and Flint, Michigan is a, is a really good one. Not, not to say that was going on at the time, but certainly other things similar to that were. It would be erroneous to suppose that America is only exists in these other points. Certainly that is what, that is the image that America believes of itself, and, and that that is the one that it projects of itself. But it's not really good enough. Like, there are other aspects, and even if we consider these other aspects in relation to Baudrillard's thought here, I think it can open up something of an interesting analysis where he could easily say, yes, all that America is, is the image that it projects of itself. 
and it is one that tries to, in projecting a certain image, erases those negative points where the image is what goes on, the image is what other people consume, the image is what people believe it to be, and in doing so can wipe its hands of those negative parts, those negative moments that plague its history. So then these moments of negativity can then just be seen as anomalies, can be seen as perhaps consequences of some kind of malfunction rather than being indicative of or being necessary for the realization of America as utopia. And then just like the Native Americans that existed prior, these people can then be put in a museum, right? Sort of uh, praised for their sacrifice in order to maintain the illusion of America. And moreover, when thinking about this part or this quote, where Baudrillard writes that no one keeps count of the mistakes made by the world's political leaders anymore, mistakes which, in days gone by, would have brought about their downfall, no one much minds these now within our present system of simulation of government and of consensus through indifference, to which I think we thinking about today, what's going on with American politics, and the, you know, the constant uh, finger-pointing going on, it seems as though we need an, uh, a new analysis. Like, how does that fit into what Baudrillard is saying here, if it, if it does at all? Like, I'm not, I'm not an advocate for taking any theorist, let alone Baudrillard, and applying it everywhere. I think that that would be incredibly naive. But thinking about America, it might be appropriate, but it doesn't seem to fit. It seems as though this passage is, has been outdated, where there is almost a hyper-real emphasis on the pitfalls of any given person, right? And then we use that as a strategy to convince ourselves of our own competence, in a sense, of our adeptness rather than our ineptitude. And then what we do with that is really it, we use it strategically in that way, which I would propose. Perhaps someone else would have a, I keep hitting that light. Perhaps someone else would have a more interesting analysis than that. But to me, right on right off the bat, on the surface, it appears to be outdated. And even thinking back then, um, uh, Baudrillard was writing at a time in which Reagan was was president. It's not all that different from what is going on today. Right? And there, I believe there's a tendency to take, um, to use Baudrillard and apply it to any specific kind of political moment and say, oh, look, this is Baudrillard realized. So people are saying that now about like Trump, people were saying it, or well, Baudrillard is saying it then with Reagan, and the same can be applied with anyone, with Nixon, who, who's going to come after Trump? Are we just simply going to say, oh, now it's real, now it's there, when ultimately these figures are symptoms of I guess a whole enterprise of banality or indifference that guides our political, at least our mainstream kind of political uh, parties, and in that way only allows for a very limited possibility of political change, of political action, and perhaps we're seeing that change now, you know, with various other political movements. But there is something to be said about the way in which politics has consistently been realized in a very oppressive form. So I think it's from there, you know, I'll kind of wrap this up with my final kind of thoughts on this. Um, it's a repetitive book, you know, for any of those that have read it. Like, he says the same thing many times, and, you know, he, he contradicts himself. At one point, you know, he's saying that people are obsessed with smiling and being proper, and then at another point he's saying that people don't connect with one another, people don't look at each other. It's like, well, which is it? But there, there, there's a lot here. Um, but this is one of his books, one of, the, one of the ones that we have to really take with a grain of salt, I find. Like, I enjoy it, but some of his claims are just absurd. Like, he, even thinking about, like, Halloween, he says that, you know, there's the onslaught or the plague of uh, razors and apples which like never actually happened or, or when he says uh, what he has to say about like sexual assault and in relation to 
liberation or sexual liberation, how these things go hand in hand. Really just a general degree of animosity towards um, women's sexual liberation, which is incredibly reductive. And when reading this, you know, I try to take from it, you know, the most interesting parts, but in doing so, I am erasing and participating in a sort of, um, I guess, apathy or kind of apathetic position where I'm not as effectively present as a political figure against some of the more outlandish claims that he lays out, the really kind of violent problematic ones that, that aren't so much present in some of his other texts because he was kind of unhinged with this like he could write whatever he wanted and someone would publish it uh, but with, with that being said it is a, a fascinating book and a fascinating look at America and I highly recommend for those that haven't read it and you know have been able to make it through my rambling to check it out but for my own part I would never tell anyone to to start with this one. Like because it is difficult, it's kind of contradictory, and it it's not quite as theoretically engaged as some of his other texts. I th I feel like there's more to get out of some of his other books, but it is a good one. For, so, you know, I'll quit rambling and for those that made it this far, thanks for checking it out. I hope you're able to get something from it and if you have any problems with what I said, you know how to call me out on it. But on that note, take care.